A few years ago, I decided I needed a major life change. Everything seemed to be going downhill. My finances, my mental health, my life. I would go weeks without sleeping sometimes as the heavy traffic passed through these city streets down below. Every time I went outside, I saw more homeless people. More garbage and trash littering the ground. More muggings and ODs and deaths. This city had become a wasteland and I knew that it was time to leave. I had no girlfriend, no wife, no kids. My parents had both passed a few years prior and I barely talked to my siblings anymore. I had nothing to tie me down to this place where I felt like I was dying inside a little more each day. That's when I sold nearly everything that I owned, got in my car and drove up to Alaska to try starting anew. I bought a small cabin and a plot of land in the middle of its majestic mountains and dark enchanting forests. In the winter, the northern lights would shine through like the eyes of God, sending out divine trails of light that danced through the sky in cosmic waves. And while the move did help me get some peace of mind, in the end, the source of all my problems had ultimately followed me thousands of miles into this endless wilderness. It would take me a long time to realize the cause of all this misery was myself. Because, as a wise man once said, Wherever I go, there I am. I lived in that cabin for three months without any major issues other than the constant threat of bears and moose and wolves. I had a rifle and a shotgun for hunting, a small garden in the backyard and a solar panel to generate electricity. Ah, this is the life, I said, relaxing on a hammock that I had strung across the corner of the cabin while staring at the endless beauty directly outside my window. White-capped mountains loomed like giants in front of thick clusters of evergreens. A virgin covering of fluffy snow made the entire world a glisten and sparkle. There wasn't a house or road in sight. No work, no stress, no pollution, no cars honking all the time. I closed my eyes, breathing in the clean air. I ended up falling asleep for a couple of hours, waking up just as the sun had started setting. Bright orange streaks mixed with the bloody smears of the fading light as it disappeared behind the mountains. I groggily arose, stumbling over to make a cup of instant coffee. As I sipped it, I wandered around the room looking for something to pass the time. There were still quite a few random objects left behind by the last owner that I hadn't gotten rid of yet. I had moved in to find a stocked bookshelf filled with classics by Philip K. Dick, Isaac Asimov, and Robert Hylian. Bored, I started rifling through the collection, looking for something good to pass the time. As I shuffled past, a maze of death and ubic, something caught my eye. A black leather-bound book with no title or author name stood there, its cover faded with time and wear. Curious, I pulled it out and opened it. I saw the cursive scrawled across the pages in a neat, copperplate script, and realized it was a diary left behind by the previous owner. The first entry was dated, January 9th, 2015. This is what it said. I don't know if I'm going crazy or not. I went into town to talk to my therapist yesterday and she said that I should try writing everything down. She talks to me like it's all in my head, but I know that it's not. When I first moved into the cabin, it seemed like paradise. I never thought in a million years that something would be slinking around at night. I never thought it would be hiding under my bed, peeking in windows and following me like a shadow. Right now, I'm snowed in with a cup of coffee in one hand and my pistol in the other. I can't sleep anymore. I keep hearing something shuffling around under my bed. Sometimes I think I even hear ragged breathing, as if a corpse with dirt in its lungs has come back to life. I've caught glimpses of that thing in the darkness. Whatever it is, its skin is loose, almost falling off the bone. It almost looks like an emaciated man. 
Its eyes are rotted and dark and its back hunched. Its spine twisted and jutting out like tumors. It moves in the slow and jerky way, but I can never seem to catch it. Its body seems broken and out of alignment. Its legs bend the wrong way sometimes. By the time that I turn on the lights or try to take a video of it, it's always disappeared. But its fetid odor remains. It lingers in the cabin like a sweet-smelling, spreading infection. I don't know what it wants from me. I want to leave, but with the storm raging outside, I'm stuck here, unable to get all the way back to town. The snow surrounds the cabin in mounds five feet high. I feel like a prisoner caged with a rabid beast, not knowing when it will strike. My wife claims that she hasn't seen or heard anything, but she keeps vanishing on me. Last night, she disappeared in the middle of a snowstorm. Where did you go? I asked her in the morning, but she said that she was here the whole time. She didn't remember anything. There's no way that she went into town. There wasn't time and the trails were impassable that far down. Something's going on here, but I don't know what it is. I'm truly scared for our lives. I slammed the diary shut, not wanting to read anymore. I didn't want to become infected by some kind of contagious cabin fever. If the last owner had gone insane in the mountains and started hallucinating naked corpses crawling around, I really didn't want to know. I shoved the diary back in the bookshelf, going for a maze of death instead. I tried to forget what I had read in the diary as I flew through the novella. All night though, I tried to get the image of the twisting man with rotted eyes out of my head, but I couldn't. I eventually fell asleep right before dawn, but as my eyes were closing, I thought that I saw a silhouette in a window, a starved man with excited black eyes that seemed to be rotting out of his skull. I thought that I saw him put his inhumanly long fingers against the glass as he leaned forward. I blinked, sitting up and glancing out into the white, snow-covered wonderland. There was nothing there. Another hunter occasionally followed the deer trails near my cabin. A frozen lake stood a quarter mile away, the surface white and covered in thick drifts of snow. I bundled up, deciding to go outside for a hike in the frigid dawn. I strapped on my snowshoes and grabbed my shotgun, as I always did when I went outside. I never knew when a bear might be waiting around the next tree after all. I opened the door seeing footprints pressed into the snow all around my house. At first, I thought it was that silhouette that I had seen, the nightmarish thing from the diary. But the footprints didn't go over to my window. They followed the trail 20 feet away, veering off toward the frozen lake at the bottom of the hill. I glanced down in that direction, seeing a black figure plodding slowly forward. Steve, I cried, recognizing my only neighbor in a four mile radius. He had a cabin about a mile away on his own little plot of land. He jumped, clearly startled by the sudden noise. His black snow pants and heavy fur coat swished together as he spun, raising his rifle high. When he saw me, he immediately lowered it and put a gloved hand up in a friendly greeting. No way, Josh. Surprised to see you up this early. He yelled over the muted, wintry landscape. The sounds always seemed different after it snowed, as if all the noise in the world had become faded and dead. Yeah, I've been having a little trouble sleeping, I said, slinging my shotgun around my shoulder. What are you doing anyway? Uh, just a little hunting, you know, he said, giving me a sly wink. Animals are always most active around dusk and dawn, it seems. That's when I always have the best luck anyway. He stepped close to me, staring me in the eyes. You do look like crap. Those bags under your eyes are big enough to carry groceries in. Yeah, trust me, I know. Hey, this might sound a little weird, but did you know the previous owner of this cabin? I asked. Steve's wrinkled old face fell into a skull. His expression immediately became guarded and distant. Uh, sure, sure, we met, he exclaimed bluntly. 
He seemed to be searching my face for something, but I didn't know what. His reaction left me feeling off balance and nervous. Is he still around? I said. Steve's scowl deepened. Buddy, I don't know what this is about, but he's dead, and he's been dead. Died in that cabin, actually. He pointed a finger at my home accusingly. With those words, my heart seemed to drop into my stomach. Waves of dread flowed through my body like water. How did he die? Like a heart attack or something, I asked. Steve's gaze turned downwards. He didn't meet my eyes. Do you know that Alaska has the highest missing persons rate in the entire United States? It's not even close. In fact, for the population size, we have far more people who go missing and never get found than anywhere else. They even have a name for it. The Alaska Triangle, Steve said, and we're square in the middle of it. I stared blankly at him, wondering where he was going with this. It seemed like a way to avoid answering my question. No, I didn't know that, I responded. Steve nodded, raising his head again. He heaved a deep sigh. Look, the thing with the last owner and his wife, it's somewhat disturbing. If you really want to know, I'll tell you, but it's certainly not going to help your peace of mind. And it definitely isn't going to help you get some sleep. I want to know. I insisted instantly. The wind started to whip past us. Flakes of ice and snow flew sideways in these sudden currents. Let's go back to your cabin then, Steve said, pulling his heavy fur-lined hood off and shaking off his long black hair behind him. I could use a bit of whiskey to warm up. We sat down with a bottle of Johnny Walker and two shot glasses. I wasn't much of a drinker, but Steve certainly was. He chugged three shots in the span of a minute. I sipped at mine, drinking half and putting it back down on the coffee table with a thunk. Steve grunted, hissing through his open mouth for a moment. Ah, that's the good stuff, he said, slamming his chest as the burning liquor worked its way down. Steve looked up at me with a new sparkle in his eyes. Ah, huh, so you want to know about what happened to Will Lenning? Well, I'll tell you that no one really knows the whole story. I used to see him occasionally come down and have a drink and talk. We all know each other around here, obviously. I nodded, motioning him on. He seemed like a normal, upstanding guy. Kind of reminded me of you, actually. A young guy trying to escape the hustle and bustle of the city life. The cancer of the American dream. Well, he was here for maybe a couple of months, I don't know. Everything seemed fine. We used to go skeet shooting occasionally, have a beer, you know. We'd get together with a couple of other hunters who lived closer to town and sometimes play poker. I never saw anything odd about Will. I never could have predicted what happened to him. He heaved a long sigh at this, looking out the window at the sharp mountains with an expression of nostalgia. Well, what happened to him? I asked, encouraging him to go on. He started talking about seeing somebody peering in through his window at night. He talked about hearing sounds from under his bed while he was laying there in the dark. Sounds like diseased breathing and shuffling. He started keeping all the lights on in his cabin 24-7. Steve leaned close to me. A glimmer of fear rippled across his pale, wrinkled face. He started to lose his mind. Started digging holes all over the place looking for something. Even in the middle of the snowstorms, I would occasionally see him outside digging. It seemed like he never slept anymore. It was classic cabin fever if I ever saw it. It was only a few weeks later that I came over here concerned. I hadn't heard from him in a few days, which was fairly unusual. I found the door hanging wide open, propped up in a chair in the exact spot where you now sit. Wool lay with a blast hole showing clear through his skull, shotgun laying at his feet. Then next to him, I found a blood-stained diary open to the middle page. The last entry was stained with red, but still visible. I remember leaning down and reading it. It was only a few sentences long. 
I glanced over at the bookshelf with the same diary saying nothing. It said something like, I see now what's going on. The twisted man is leading me to the truth. Today I will finally find it. And that was his last note? I asked, my heart hammering in my chest. He nodded. Yeah, I went into town and got some rangers to come check it out. Eventually they got cops and a CSI here. They took all the stuff as evidence, including the diary, he said. And good riddance, I say. Reading something like that is never beneficial. Sometimes delusions spread like a virus, you know what I mean. I did, but I said nothing. I glanced back at the diary, its black leather cover gleaming like a crouching snake. And I wondered, if the police took the diary as evidence, how did it get back here? You said that he had a wife living here with him too, I asked. Yeah, she went missing around the same time, he said. Pretty bizarre, the cops thought that maybe she just moved away, but... He shook his head grimly. As far as I know, she was never seen again. It was like she had evaporated into thin air. After Steve left, I walked stifly over to the bookshelf, taking down the diary. I flipped open through the pages. In the middle, I found the last entry. Spatters of old, darkened blood, or scattered over the page like raindrops. I found the note, and I read the date. January 27th, 2015, it read. Well, Lenin had not lived long after he had started seeing the Twisted Man. I wondered if my fate would be the same. The sun had started to set outside as I sat with the diary at the small circular kitchen table eating some stewed venison and rice as I read through the entries. At the end, Will Lenning said the Twisted Man had been trying to guide him somewhere, that in fact the Twisted Man had been trying to protect him from some great evil, rather than being the source of it. I scoffed, feeling a flash of anger at his stupidity. His naivety obviously led to his death, but then a flash of insight struck me like lightning. What if I was committing the same kind of stupidity? Perhaps I should just grab my gun and valuables and leave. I could take off on the snowmobile and be in town within a couple of hours. But in my heart I knew that I wouldn't. Something about the mystery of all this beckoned me to stay. Like a siren leading sailors to destruction, my curiosity called out to me, and I knew that I wouldn't be leaving that night. I needed answers, and sadly I would find them. I had fallen asleep with an empty bottle of beer in my hand. I sat in front of the TV which only got satellite reception. There were, of course, no cable or phone lines threading their way through the forest. All my power came from storage to solar energy. Since I rarely watched TV and really only used it to cook or heat up water for bathing, the energy produced was sufficient even in winter. Tonight, though, I needed its sound, its mindless flashing of lighting colors and canned laughter. It seemed to drive away the creeping, suffocating presence like a candle. I woke suddenly, and the TV flashed with static. The repetitive hissing of the white noise spit from the speakers like thousands of snakes. I glanced up at the clock. 3.33 a.m. I looked around the dark cabin, confused for a long moment. I didn't understand what had woken me so abruptly. The satellite had never gone out before either, even with the howling winds and freezing hail of the Alaskan winter. The TV started flickering as if the static were rising upwards. Black lines traced their way horizontally across the screen. The hissing deepened into a gurgle and for a second, I thought that I heard faint words behind the white noise. I thought that I heard breathing, slow and diseased, like the death gasp of a drowning man. A black line rose across the TV and an image came into view. The cabin was suddenly plunged into silence except for the shrieking, wintry wind outside. I leaned close to the screen, confused at what I was looking at. It looked like a live camera feed of a room. As I took in the details, I realized that it was my cabin. I saw myself in the chair, leaning close to the screen. 
I raised my hand and the miniature version of me on the screen did likewise. Ice water seemed to drip down my spine as waves of dread coursed through my body. What the heck is this? I whispered, looking back to where the camera should be. It was just a coarse wooden ceiling in that corner. I turned back to the screen and I nearly screamed. The TV showed a pale, naked man crouching directly behind my chair now. With jerky movements, he rose, his broken spine twisting and shivering. A hissing voice rang out from the speakers. It spoke as if it had dirt and writhing maggots in its throat. He is a killer, the shadow of death. Many have fallen, many lie buried across this forest. You will be next. He's watching you. Long broken fingers with blackened nails reached out to touch my shoulders. I jumped out of the chair, stumbling back as I spun around in terror. My back smashed into the TV and it fell to the floor with a shattering of glass and an explosion of light. In those few moments before the darkness descended on me like a blanket, I thought that I glimpsed a pale, sunken face with rotted blackened eyes peeking out from behind the chair. I turned down every light in the cabin, but there was no sign of the twisted man now. I knew that I had to get out of there, though. I thought about the warning that the voice had spoken. If the creature wanted to attack me, then why hadn't it just killed me while I was sleeping? None of it made sense. Who was watching me, the twisted man? And if he was, why warn me? Perhaps it was psychological warfare, I thought to myself. Perhaps the twisted man simply liked to play with his food before he ate it. The thoughts raced through my head at a thousand miles an hour as I threw on snow pants and a couple heavy sweaters and coats. I covered up my entire body as much as I could to try to prevent frostbite. I had made up my mind to flee. There was no snowstorm tonight though the entire landscape was blanketed in it and I knew the windshield would be like an ice blade whipping against my skin. It was extremely dangerous to travel in the middle of the night like this in temperatures that might reach negative 30 degrees. Steve had been right after all. Alaska had the highest missing persons rate of any state, and many of them were never found. Their bodies likely frozen solid in the deep snow, dozens of miles from the nearest town. I grabbed my shotgun, jumped on my snowmobile, and started heading to Steve's cabin. I hoped that I could wait there until the sunrise and then figure out what to do next. But fate would take the decision out of my hands. I felt like there were eyes watching me as I drove along the narrow winding deer trail. The bows of the evergreens reached into the path like greedy hands, grabbing at my coat and legs. More than a couple of times I saw a pale naked figure standing in the snow, but it was always gone when I turned to look. I gave a sigh of relief when Steve's place appeared in the distance. I could see the lights twinkling through the small windows of his log cabin. I pulled up next to his door looking down. I saw two pairs of footprints there, one much smaller than the other. I found it odd, but I shrugged it off. The snowmobile cut out with a sucking gurgle. I knocked on the door hard a few times. Steve appeared after a few moments groggy and half-dressed. He blinked slowly as he looked me up and down. His wrinkled face fell into a frown. Steve, I need a favor, I said quickly. Something weird is happening in my cabin. Can I stay here until the morning? Until maybe I can go into town or something. I just can't stay at my place tonight. He nodded, yawning and motioning me in. You can sleep on the couch, I guess, Steve said. Put that shotgun somewhere safe, though, boy. He had a partitioned bedroom in his cabin. It was significantly larger than my little one-room cabin, though it was basically still just a joint kitchen living room, a small bedroom and a bathroom. He pointed to a well-worn couch in the corner and gave me an apathetic wave as he stumbled back into his bedroom slamming the door shut. I couldn't sleep though. I tiptoed around the room looking at Steve's bookshelf. He had a rather strange taste in books. Lots of Anne rule and true crime there. 
I saw dozens of books about Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, Richard Chase, Herbert Mullen, Jeffrey Dahmer, and Richard Ramirez among the collection. At the end, a large black binder stood, unlabeled and worn looking. It reminded me of the look on that leather-bound diary for a second, and my heart dropped. But logically, I knew this was just a coincidence. Yet still, I pulled out the binder and my curiosity peaked. What I found inside filled me with dread and horror. Countless news clippings covered the length of it. The first clipping was from nearly 20 years earlier, about a woman who went missing in the Alaskan forest while hiking. A later one confirmed that her body was never found and that her family was still hoping that she would turn up somewhere. A reward was offered for any information, it said. And every page after that was more of the same. Missing woman, murdered, missing man, no leads. I kept flipping through until I found clippings about Will Lenning's death and the sudden disappearance of his wife. On the article about it, Steve had used a red marker to scrawl. Ha <laughs> ha. Right next to it. I heard the click of a gun being cocked from behind me. I froze as Steve's voice traveled across the room like a whisper. How do you like my work, friend? He asked, his tone jovial and mocking. I still held the binder of horrors tightly in my hand as I stared open-mouthed at this man that I thought I knew. It's you. What? You killed Will Lenning and his wife and a lot of other women apparently. Everything felt unreal as if I were stuck in a dream. Steve's grin spread across his face, but his blue eyes stayed cold and dead. Yeah, well, she was cheating on him with me anyway. Just another one of those, you know. They always get what's coming to them in the end. He hissed with hatred oozing from his voice. That's too bad, really, I just killed another one tonight. I was planning on saving you for later. The urge isn't too bad yet right now, after all. It comes in cycles, you see. It comes in waves. I saw a glimmer of pale, naked flesh writhing behind Steve. With jerky movements, the twisted man came up behind him. I said nothing, just watching with wide-eyed horror and amazement. You need help, man, I whispered. Steve laughed. Help. The only help they give people like me is a needle in the arm. You know that. That's why it's important to always cover your tracks. The twisted man ran a long broken finger across Steve's neck. Steve gave a strangled cry and jumped. He spun around screaming. I glanced over at my shotgun next to the couch. I jumped for it as Steve turned back to me, firing his pistol twice. The first bullet soared high above me, raining wood splinters down on my head, but the second ripped into my leg. A cold burning pain ran like fire up my shin. I screamed in agony and battle fury as I gripped the shotgun spinning and firing. Steve's head exploded and the slug ripped through his brain. His forehead collapsed like a smashed melon as bone splinters and red sprayed the wall behind him. The twisted man stood there hunched over, grinning up at me. I felt warm blood gushing from my leg as I stared back at him, breathing hard. I wondered if I was dying. You, you weren't after me at all, were you? I asked. You were after Steve. But the twisted man said nothing. After a long moment, he slinked back into the shadows of the bedroom and disappeared. As night crawled its way toward morning, I thought back to the words the twisted man had spoken through the TV, suddenly understanding everything. He's a killer, the shadow of death. Many have fallen, many lie buried across this forest. You'll be next, he's watching you. He hadn't been trying to hurt me at all, he had been trying to warn me. He had probably tried to warn Will Lenning and his wife too. I wrapped my leg in gauze, gritting my teeth. The wound looked puckered and deep, but I could still move my foot, and the bullet had gone clean through the flash. I poured alcohol on it, screaming in pain as it burned its way through my skin. After rummaging through Steve's bathroom, I found some prescription painkillers and swallowed a handful of them with a beer. 
I knew that I would need this to get through the pain of riding into town with a busted up leg. As the sun finally rose, I made my way outside the blood-stained floors of the cabin to my snowmobile. Before I left, I glanced back at that horrid place, the scene of so much torment and death. In the open doorway of the twisted man stood, his back hunched, his rotted lips grinning at me. His hand lifted up into the air with jerky movements and waved. I waved back as I started the engine and headed into town. The first thing people noticed about Saklas was his metal teeth. Coated in steel, his long, sharp, silvery teeth always gleamed when he smiled. The Saklas was an albino. His pink eyes and colorless skin looked slightly inhuman, especially on such a large, muscular body. I never saw him come out in the daytime. Perhaps the light hurt his eyes. He always wore trench coats and black jeans and boots. It appeared that he had shaved all the hair in his head. It made his chalk-white skull seem to throb in the darkness like a mutated, fleshy egg. That guy gives me the creeps, my girlfriend Stacy said as she stared out the window of our trailer park, seeing him disappear down one of the side streets. Her chestnut-colored hair hung over her back in a French braid. Her dark eyes narrowed as she looked out into the night. I think he gives us all the creeps, I said, shrugging and taking a sip of the steaming cup of coffee that I held in my hand. He walks around here every night, though. What can you do? Uh, you could get a gun, Stacy said, glancing over at me. I sighed. I don't want a gun, I said. You're far more likely to accidentally shoot a family member then. But my words were cut off by a blood-curdling scream from outside. I jumped. The coffee cup fell to the floor. I saw it tumbling, the burning liquid spilling out all over my legs and slippered feet. I gasped, stumbling back. Oh, come on, I yelled, looking up at Stacy. Her face had gone pale as she continued to stare out the window. I saw her hands trembling, her fingers clenching into fists. Her eyes had widened to the size of dinner blades. I took a few stiff steps towards her, putting my hand on her shoulder. What's wrong? I asked, looking out the window. I saw an old woman backpedaling away from a chubby man with cream-colored skin and silvery orbs for eyes. He hissed like some sort of rabid animal, showing the two long, curving vampiric teeth that stabbed out of his mottled and white gums. The old woman swung a heavy purse in front of her body over and over, shrieking in a cantankerous voice. Streams of blood flowed from bite marks on her neck and shoulder. Her white nightgown had become soaked in wet crimson blotches that clung to her skinny and bony body. The man laughed, a sound like a freezing wind blowing through a graveyard. His voice echoed through the park, sounding raspy and diseased. You're surrounded. Nowhere to run. Leave me alone, she yelled in a quavering voice. Get away, you lunatic, I'm calling the cops. His hand shot out in a blur and grabbed her wrist, the snapping of bones reverberating down the street. I felt sick as I listened to her frantic shrieks fill the air. Shards of bone stabbed through the skin of her wrist. Her right hand nearly touched the back of her arm. Bright streams of blood spurted from the destroyed limb. She raised her red hand in front of her face, staring at it in amazement and horror. I watched her fall back onto the concrete. It all seemed to happen in slow motion. The vampiric abomination lunged forward in a blur. His long fingers came up, wrapping around her hair. He twisted her head back. She looked like a sheep waiting to be slaughtered. His curving fangs bit through the skin of her neck. As her eyes rolled back in her head and her screams faded to nothing, he drank. I ran around the trailer locking all the doors and windows. Dark skulking silhouettes passed by on all sides, hissing to each other in strange and foreign tongues. 
At that moment, the power cut out, and we were plunged into total darkness. Oh, come on, I said, stumbling into a table. Stacy was nearby, trying to get the police on the line. She held the cell phone close to her ear, whispering as if we were in a graveyard. After a few moments, I heard her murmuring words float through the shadows. Yes, hello, my name is Stacy Kitman. We need help immediately. Somebody has been murdered outside. Send help to the Granite Pond Trailer Park, Unit 777. Her voice was cut off by the sound of shattering glass. She screamed. I heard the phone fall to the ground with a clatter. It landed screen up and its dim light continued to allow me to see faintly across the room. Stacy's chalk white face hovered in front of the smashed window. She choked, gagging and fighting. Wrapped around her neck, I saw a pale, emaciated arm with black, claw-like nails. A few moments later, I heard the locked front door break open with a single and powerful blow. Standing there stood a Saklas with his grinning metal teeth, silhouetted in the moonlight like a pale demon rising out of hell. Behind him loomed a dozen of those vampiric abominations with eyes like pale moonlight. There were blacks, whites, and olive-skinned complexions among the changed. A few vampiric women stood in the crowd, fresh blood dripping from their fangs. I even saw a little girl among the undead. Stacy's eyes bulged out of her head. She tried to scream, but the arm tightened around her throat, choking off her air. On the floor, I heard the faint voice of the 911 operator calling out from the other end from the cell phone. As Saklas stepped forward triumphantly, I knew that we were doomed. I saw death in his cold gaze and in his iron grin. Stacy gave a choked gasp. Tears streamed down her face and she silently sobbed. Her back held tightly against the wall as she faced down her doom. No, oh, I'm really sorry about all this, Sakla said disingenuously, his eyes flashing with amusement and excitement. But I have a job to do after all. The master says we must build an army, and a wise man once said, an army runs on its stomach. He gave a quick nod to his inhuman zealots. With a scream, Stacy disappeared out the window. I started to run toward her, my arm outstretched, but a pale blur zoomed across the room and tackled me. A large, thin vampire came loping around the front of the trailer, effortlessly dragging a struggling Stacy behind him. Stacy and I had our hands yanked behind our backs. We were dragged into the kitchen where the grinning, stoning faces of the monsters regarded us with bloodlust and hunger. Okay, who gets these ones? Saklas asked in a bored tone. The little girl stepped forward, gnashing her teeth. A small rivulet of clear drool dripped from her tiny and pursed mouth. I must eat, I haven't eaten yet tonight. Saklas gave her a wide, toothy smile and motioned her forward. Her tanned skin looked like stone. Fangs protruded from her mouth like two deadly hypodermic needles. Uh, take the girl first, Sakla said, pointing at Stacy. Her blood looks clear and pure. This one here probably tastes bitter and rancid. He grabbed me by the hair as he said it, roughly shoving my head to the side. I'll take him after she finishes off the woman. A black vampire sat, his shaved head gleaming in the dull moonbeam streaming in from the kitchen window. Their silvery eyes gave off a dim light that covered the room in a pale, ghostly glow. Like the girl, this man's skin looked solid and unyielding, as if it had turned into hard granite. He ran a long tongue over his fangs. It looked forked like the tongue of a serpent. The vampiric girl lunged forward, running at Stacy in her excitement over the fresh meat struggling in front of her. Stacy screamed. She stood next to the sink, both her wrists pinned behind her back by a strong, muscular, vampiric man. The man's pale face glittered as Stacy struggled to pull her slender wrists out of his iron grasp. She tried to kick backwards, aiming at his shins and knees, but he didn't even flinch. 
He bent her arms back, forcing her head down until Stacy was face to face with the girl. Please don't hurt me, Stacy pleaded. I tried to fight against the vampire pinning my arms behind my back. He pushed my arms up, a stabbing pain ran through my body as I screamed in fury and agony. Leave her alone, I shrieked. Saklas gave me a sly wink. The little girl opened her mouth wide, far wider than seemed humanly possible, as if her jaw had unhinged like a snake's. A forked tongue flicked out. In a blur, her gaping black hole of a mouth snapped shut around Stacy's neck. She gave a choked gasp. Stacy's eyes rolled back in her head, the whites shining like cataracts. My screaming devolved into sobbing as twin crimson rivers flowed from the bite. The vampiric girl reminded me of an infant suckling on its mother's breast. She gave happy grunts and soft moans of pleasure as she drank. At that moment, I knew that we were both doomed. The eyes of the many vampires hung in the air like bright silver galaxies spiraling in the void. In that moment, it felt like all of them were focused directly at me. My adrenaline was so high that the world seemed to shimmer translucent white. I could feel my heart beating like a jackhammer. In the gloom of this, nobody noticed these silhouettes sneaking in through the shattered trailer park door, especially not me and my sorrow and powerlessness. The attack from the figure came silently. An old Spanish man with a sharp scimitar sword held in his hand sprinted forwards. He was dressed in a coarse poncho with sharp triangular patterns of black, orange, and white jutting through the middle. The curving blade gleamed in the dim light as it soared towards the nearest vampire. It audibly whizzed through the air in a blur. The vampire, a pale young woman, didn't even get the chance to turn around before her head flew off her body. As if in slow motion, I watched it soar across the room as spiraling gouts of blood flew from her neck. The eyes continued to shine and the mouth continued to gnash the air, even as it smacked hard into the wall before landing on the wooden floor with a heavy crash. The vampire holding an unconscious Stacy dropped her hard to the floor with a loud growl advancing forward toward this new threat. The little vampiric girl rose, turning her head towards the dangerous newcomer. Her fangs made a sucking sound when they pulled out of the skin. The other vampires had devolved into chaos. I felt my hands released as the one behind me rushed forward to attack the old man. Sacklas's expression fell into a deep skull. He pulled out an enormous black revolver from his inner coat pocket aiming it at the old man's head. A gunshot rang out from the front of the house. I saw an old woman standing there with a rifle held in her hands. She was dressed similarly to the old man, wearing some sort of poncho that might have been at home in the Andes. Sockless gave a bloody gurgle before falling to the ground. An exit wound the size of an orange stuck out the back of his chest. I could see the tangled masses of organs and flesh held within. The laser sight quickly moved on to the next target, dancing over the head of a pale young woman. The old man continued advancing on the vampires surrounding Stacy, striking at their necks. He ducked when they tried clawing him with their long black talons. He moved like a much younger man, slipping through the crowd of monsters like a shadow. The old woman continued firing her rifle, dropping another three of the vampires. Stacy had started to regain consciousness. Her eyes fluttered and she moaned softly. She crawled forward, pushing herself up slowly with her trembling hands. Thin rivulets of blood continued to stream down her neck, staining her white shirt with crimson splotches. Come at me! The old man cried in a battle frenzy as another vampire rushed him. He brought the blade straight down into the center of the vampiric man's skull. His head split open with a crunch of bones and a blossoming explosion of brains. You two, it's time to go, he yelled at us. I didn't need any more encouragement than that. I ran over to Stacy, threading my arms under her shoulders before dragging her up. She staggered, putting out her hands before her like a blind person. 
I wrapped my arm around her and helped her stumble forward. The few remaining vampires had all retreated by this point. The little girl and a few others ran straight through the back door. It splintered into a hundred tiny fragments as they smashed right through it without slowing. Within moments, they had faded into the night. Now we have to find somewhere safe, the old man said. There is more of them coming, but for now we have a car waiting outside. We need to get you out of here before they show up. Oh, thank God, Stacy mumbled. Her pale face seemed haunted. Within her eyes, I saw what kind of nightmare she and I were trapped in reflected back at me. We found a black SUV with the headlights on parked in the middle of the street. The old man gestured me and Stacy to the back. He pushed his long, silvery hair back, pulling down the hood of the poncho. His face was covered in sweat. He went over to some bushes in my yard, wiping the blade of the sword off on the leaves trying to clean away some of the foul vampiric blood. Stacy collapsed in the back seat with a long sigh. I put my arm around her, pulling her close. She shivered in my grasp. Her body felt cold and small. The old man jumped into the driver's seat and the old woman in the passenger seat. They kept their weapons next to them, continuously checking the rearview mirrors in the shadows of the forest nearby. Within seconds, the old man peeled out, heading out of the trailer park. We passed countless bodies, drained of blood and left in the street like pieces of garbage. Are you okay? The old woman asked, turning her head to look back at us. Stacy nodded weakly. I think so. She only got me for a couple of seconds before you guys came in, I think. It hurts though. It's like somebody stabbed me in the neck. They did stab you in the neck, I said. I turned to look the old woman in the eyes. The expression there seemed wise and peaceful. I'm Jack and this is Stacy. Thank you so much for saving us. I thought that we were dead for sure. I'm Cristiano and this is Maria, the old man said. His dark eyes constantly alert as we swerved through the labyrinthine streets of the enormous trailer park. I could see the front entrance by now. Behind it, a single police car parked there with its lights silently flashing. The blue and red strobing made the shadows all around us jump and dance in every flashes. On the ground nearby, I saw the bodies of the two officers. Their pale faces stared up at the cloudless sky, their lips blue. Deep puncture marks on their necks dribbled clotted blood down their cold and dead flesh. So much for the cops, I said. Cristiano nodded. The police never did much in my country either, he said. The vampiro do as they will and pass where they will. The master has much money and power after all. He can buy the police and government officials. I leaned forward, interested. Do you know what's going on here? I whispered intently. Do you know where these things came from? He nodded grimly. I've known of your friend Saklos for quite a while. I knew he was involved in trafficking rings. They move illegals across the border for a price or so they claim. Some of them do arrive surely, but a lot of them just disappear. The family members notice eventually, but who can they call? They don't know if they disappeared in Guatemala or in Mexico, or if they made it to the U.S. after all and then something happened to them. It's the perfect crime, right? I nodded. Maria looked sickened. It is foul and evil, she said. They feed on everyone, the men, women, and children. The vampiro do not discriminate. In fact, I think they prefer the younger blood, especially that of infants. Cristiano muttered darkly at this, making the sign of the cross. Anyway, the vampiro worked their way up here, as they will over time. They got smuggled in the night. Perhaps the vampiro trekked along the long, dark desert, or perhaps they were smuggled on the back of trucks. But regardless, they are here now and the master wishes to expand his army. For many years, we kept this plague contained to the Andes, to the small villages hidden in the cracks of the mountains. But now it has spread far and fast. 
It was only last year we got the first reports of the Vampiro in Mexico, Maria said, and now they're up here. We came when we heard rumors of the planned attack. We captured, let's say, a spy. Her eyes glittered. He didn't want to talk, but after I brought out the pliers and the silver dagger, he was only too happy to scream his song of truth. We have a safe house nearby. A place owned by a sympathetic soul, let's say. There is a resistance forming all across the land, from Brazil to Texas. Indeed, many new souls have joined in the struggle, though for now we fight in secret. We call ourselves the servants of the Iron Cross, and until the Vampiro declares itself publicly, neither will we. We pulled into the dirt driveway of the house. The lights were all on, the yellow light shining through the windows like a jack-o'-lantern. The lawn looked perfectly manicured. A quaint wooden fence surrounded the house. Beyond it, the land sloped downward into thick woods. Yet we weren't nearly far enough away from the trailer park or the vampires for my peace of mind. Stacy continuously glanced behind her, but the wounds on her neck had stopped bleeding and she seemed to be regaining some of her strength. Christiana led the way, unlocking the front door and flinging it open. He called out as we entered, a bedraggled ragtag group. Hello, he cried, but the house stayed as silent as death. We walked through the front hallway. I noticed the ancient statues lining expensive mahogany tables on each side. I leaned close to one, seeing a Mayan god. It showed a slithering serpent with feathers and wings. Room by room, we searched the house. It was indeed totally empty. Maria took us upstairs. She slipped a silver key out of her pocket, unlocking an enormous wooden cabinet in the master bedroom. Behind it, I saw lines of pistols, rifles, shotguns, and grenades. Boxes of ammo were stocked on the top shelf. Thousands of rounds sorted by caliber and piled at the very top of the eight-foot-high cabinet. You guys better take something, Maria said, her eyes gleaming as she looked at the weapons. She ran her wrinkled fingers over the scope of her rifle, a faint smile playing in the corners of her lips. The Vampiro are spreading and they will surely hunt us all down before long. Nowhere is safe. We must stand and fight. There are, after all, worse things than death. We had gone around the safe house, locking all the doors and checking all the windows. Stacy and I had both taken shotguns and loaded them with slugs. I wasn't very accurate with a gun anyway at longer ranges and Stacy had only fired a gun once, but I hoped that would be enough. I explained to her about loading slugs in the chamber, racking it, and how to turn the safety on and off. I knew a single shot from a slug would rip through flesh like butter, and I hoped the extra firepower would compensate for our lack of experience somewhat. I loaded five slugs into the Benelli. We had filled our pockets with extra ammunition. It wasn't long before I heard the hissing from in front of the house. It floated through the air like a death knell. Cristiano gave a panicked shout from where he kept watch near the window. We have company, he screamed. Get ready. I ran over to the window with Stacy by my side. Cristiano had his sword sheathed around his waist. Slung around his shoulder, he held an M16, the laser sight to flick down and ready to aim. Ah, shotgun's good. You can use the slugs to shoot through walls. Really? I asked, feeling the terror and uncertainty of the few moments before a deadly battle. I felt like I would crawl right out of my skin. Cristiano nodded. When they get near, you and her start shooting through the walls, especially the front door. They'll hit there in the windows. Marie and I will shoot at them from the sides. Now go secure the front door. As I ran past, I glanced out the window. In the front of the pack, I saw Saklas. Blood still covered his shirt, but the wound had sealed over with some black, scab-like growth. His eyes glowed silver, the light spiraling and whirling in hypnotic currents. Behind him, I saw a few dozen of the monstrosities standing tall and fearless. They formed a triangle with the majority in the back. Come out, Cristiano, Saklas yelled. 
You've been a worthy opponent, and for that, I will give you a quick death. You've killed many of my comrades, Cristiano, but the master is forgiving. And yet, if we have to come in, you will die screaming. We can make it last, Cristiano. We can stretch it out for you. I watched this intense exchange through the small window at the top of the front door. Saklas hissed the last sentence, his twin metal fangs protruding out of his mouth like the teeth of a rattlesnake. Go to hell, Maria shouted from the left front window on the bottom floor. She fired a gun, scattering the vampires. They all ran at once towards the front of the house. Saklas called out commands in a low and guttural voice. Cristiano started shooting, emptying his clip as fast as he could into the crowd. Get the windows, Saklas cried to those behind him. We'll take the door. Within seconds, Saklas and eight or nine others were rushing towards me and Stacy. I felt my hands shaking as I nodded at her. It's time, I said. Get ready to start shooting. I love you, she whispered as a tear slipped from her eye. If we die... Her words were cut off as the door shuddered in its frame. More powerful blows rained down on it from the other side. I inhaled deeply before putting the Benelli point blank against the wood and firing. I quickly emptied all five rounds through the door. Stacy fired through the side window, her pale sweaty face shining in the light. I heard screaming from outside. A tormented, gurgling death cry that rippled its way out of the abomination's throats. I peered through the window as I reloaded, seeing three of the vampires had giant holes torn into their faces and chests. The Sakla still stood though and with a final and powerful kick, he sent the hole ridden door flying open. It smacked me hard in the face. I saw white stars for a few moments while I stumbled back and nearly falling. I slammed the back of my head hard against the wall, sliding down as Stacy screamed. Maria and Cristiano came running over firing as dozens of vampires streamed in through the open door and others crawled through the windows. More smashing came from the back of the house. I knew at that moment that we were surrounded. As Stacy frantically tried to reload her gun, Saklas raised a bone-white hand, black talons ripping out of the ends of his fingers. He swiped it hard across Stacy's arms, leaving four deep gouges in her skin and sending the gun flying. She gave a cry of surprise and pain. I groaned, my head swimming as I tried to rise to my feet. I still held the gun loosely in one hand. I was seeing double and felt warm blood streaming down the back of my scalp. No, Cristiano yelled as a vampire jumped on his back. He fired quickly at those surrounding him, blowing holes through their blackened hearts and cold smiling faces. The one on his back sunk its teeth into his neck. I saw Cristiano slow down as his screams faded. With a crash, they fell together to the ground. Like a lamprey stuck to a fish, the vampire held on, drinking his blood as Cristiano stopped struggling. Don't kill him, Saklas yelled. I want him to suffer first. He turned to Stacy, grinning like a skull. I pulled the trigger, hitting another vampire in the chest as he ran in the front door but Sakla still stood totally unharmed. He unhinged his jaw and lunged forward, biting deeply into Stacy's neck. A hand fell down on my shoulder. I jumped, seeing Maria. Her eyes looked like a panicked animal's. In each hand, she held a grenade. It's too late for us, she said, motioning to the smashed window. My husband's dead. I will take these monsters out before I die, though. Now get out, run. I glanced back, seeing Stacy's blue lips and dilated pupils. I knew that she was dead, and I jumped through the window, landing hard in the yard. I had dropped the gun in the panic of the moment. As I sprinted across the yard, an explosion rocked the earth. I looked back, seeing a pillar of flame rising high into the sky. The shockwave seemed to travel through the air, rattling my bones and stealing my breath away. The eye of the flame danced higher a swirling red cyclone that spiraled into the sky. I heard screaming from the house now. Many hissing, gurgling voices joined in as more vampires had died in the inferno. 
I didn't know where to go. I stumbled through the dark streets for a long time I had pounding. Tears streamed from my eyes as I thought about Stacy's death. After a few hours, I saw headlights streaming down the hills in the distance. It looked like a caravan of cars and SUVs were on their way into town. I started running towards them hoping that the Calvary had finally arrived. I thought that I heard footsteps matching mine, but I glanced back, seeing nothing but shadows. Yet after another few seconds I was sure of it. Someone was following me. I stopped, looked back. In the shadows on the side of the road I saw two figures. One of them had metal teeth and glowing eyes. And next to him stood Stacy. Her wounds fully healed her skin like stone. The light shone from both of their eyes now. The SUVs and cars sped toward me, their headlights parting the dark night. The two figures retreated back into the forest as dozens of government agents in black suits stepped out, rushing towards me. After seeing Stacy's ultimate fate, I thought back to earlier in the night when Maria had said, There are, after all, worse things than death, and now I know she was right.